Dr. Rick Grade uh, uh, from Florida who will be discussing the importance of some of his importance of fungicide drench treatments for successful basal downy mildew control. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andy. Uh, it's de definitely a pleasure to be here today to see a lot of old friends. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Xuan Zhang, who's uh, also a University of Florida uh, cooperator on this project. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about, yeah, some of the drench uh, fungicide treatments that we've done over the years. Now, I will be shifting gears a little bit uh, because uh, I'm going to be talking about direct seeded basil uh, for the most part. But uh, for the most part, since its uh, introduction in 2007, basil downy mildew has been continually present in Florida. We do not have an off-season. Basil is grown up by a lot of homeowners and backyard gardeners. There is a continual presence all year round, whether it's in the summertime, the wintertime. You cannot assume that it is not present. So this is one thing that I, I stress to our growers. Uh, the spores are easily dis dislodged. Uh, this has been talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, lots of spores, they're always in the air, and if you have basil in the field, basil downy mildew will find it. And so you've got to assume that it's there from the time it emerges from the ground. So one of the things that I did in some, a lot of my early fungicide trials, I was concentrating on foliar sprays, and uh, I was quite successful in controlling it, uh, but a lot of times I would find that late, late uh, seedlings that were germinating a little bit past those first to emerge from the ground that perhaps we had put a foliar application on were being skipped and they were coming up diseased and then this would serve as an inoculum source for the rest of the canopy. So because of this we started a series of uh, experiments to uh, look at seedling drenches and uh, what I'm talking about in effect are banded soil drenches uh, right on that crop itself. And uh, we looked at a number of uh, different uh, products. Uh, our early trials uh, consisted of the seedling drenches applied at the first true leaf stage. So I'm not applying to the bare soil before the crop has emerged. I'm letting the crop just emerge uh, just before the first uh, true leaf is, is showing up, really cotyledon stage. Uh, these trials were conducted on both uh, sand and muck soils. Uh, we did this for comparison. Typically, muck binds uh, uh, compounds a little bit more than sand. And the applications were made using a backpack sprayer delivering a, a good volume, uh, about 144 gallons per acre. So it was a, a good solid drench, typically uh, very wet that soil. You'll see a picture of that in the uh, next uh, slide. Uh, these sprays were concentrated, okay? So I'm not just spraying broadcast. Uh, these were concentrated four inch bands right over the row and on those plants themselves. All the experiments were replicated, three to four replications, uh, randomized plot design, and uh, the basal plants were assessed for downy mildew uh, incidence. I'm not going to talk much about incidence. I'll be talking about severity. And this was the percentage of uh, foliage, the entire plant that was exhibiting downy mildew symptoms. Typically, the ratings were done two to three weeks following drenching. I'll, I'll make note of uh, some of those uh, uh, periods. Here you can see the, the uh, drench uh, treatments that we did. You can see it's a concentrated band right over the row. Uh, you really can't see the plants here, but this is, this is uh, pretty much the stage at this stage or just a little bit uh, later in some instances at that first true leaf stage. So I'm not waiting for just a couple, uh, two to four leaves to come up. I'm trying to drench these plants early because we're expecting mildew to be in the area from the time they emerge from the ground. So we wanted to protect them early on. And one of the things, uh, many of the other trials that have been talked about, most of us spray on a weekly basis. That Meg uh, went to twice a week on some of her organic trials. Most of my spraying, uh, the follow-up sprays were done on a weekly basis. And you saw very few zeros in those previous talks. That's because a week may be too long, and I want to stress that. But uh, here you can see uh, in an early trial, we looked at a couple of the different phosphites um, at uh, uh, a one and a two pint uh, rate. Now this was Profite, uh, which I've had good success with uh, uh, foliarly. I've, I usually use higher rates. Uh, however, at that stage, uh, I've seen a little bit of phyto, so that's why I went with these slightly lower rates for this uh, drench uh, uh, trial. Uh, we used the uh, regalia, uh, one of the SAR materials. 
The OXTP is is that uh, Zorvec uh, that you've looked at. Uh, Meg referred to it as Zorvec. Uh, and for some of you that may be familiar, it used to be referred to as QGU42. Uh, it was a Dupont product. It's uh, now uh, uh, owned by uh, Syngenta, at least the North American rights. And so we were looking at this. Uh, this was in the early stages. I, I was looking with a CV uh, C uh, NSC um, formulation. We had uh, uh, Presidio, Quadris, Vasaplant, another SAR material, Aliette, a phosphite, aluminum phosphite, and then we had Ritamil uh, Gold EC at a uh, uh, half a pint, a pint uh, rate. And if you look at the uh, severities, uh, these, these were applied on January 10th, so 20 days later, you can see the level of control. We did have significant differences. For the most part, the phosphites uh, did not provide a significant difference uh, in control, a little bit uh, of suppression, I'd call it. Uh, the two SAR materials, Regalia and Vasaplant, again, I'd, I'd term that only suppression. The best control was seen with two different compounds, that being the Ritamil Gold. Uh, at the two different rates, uh, we did see, uh, we didn't see a rate effect, at, at least at this, uh, in this trial, uh, between the 8 and the 16 ounce. But you can see even at the end of the trial, uh, these were still effective. Uh, this was on February 6th. Again, note the time between uh, application and the time of that rating. The other compound that really kind of stood out was the OXTP, and that uh, gave very good control, almost as well as uh, the uh, Ritamil in our trial. So this stimulated us to look at those two uh, compounds in particular at maybe some different rates and some different trials. Uh, here you can see a, a bar chart showing those different uh, compounds. Uh, the Profite uh, saw a little bit of suppression early on, but by the end of the trial, no control. Regalia and the Vasaplant, two SARs, again, we saw some suppression early on, but not much control from those. Uh, the Aliette didn't provide too much. That's similar to the uh, phosphites. And uh, Quadris, Presidio, kind of intermediate, uh, so they showed uh, some promise. But we, we struck uh, uh, a deal with these two, uh, the OXDP and Ritamil for looking at those uh, in more depth later on. So from that uh, early study, uh, some conclusions. Uh, a number of fungicides showed good potential uh, when applied. Um, of those uh, that were trialed, the OXTP, uh, Ritamil Gold, Presidio, and Quadris uh, showed significant differences. And uh, the uh, phosphites and the SARs, for the most part, were less effective or not at all. The, o the uh, Ritamel Gold and the OXTP gave us the longest residual and the best uh, efficacy. So with that in mind, we uh, did some more trials in 2013. Looking at Ritamel, these are uh, ounces per acre. Ritamel Gold, uh, 8 ounce, 16 and 24 ounces. And this is by itself, uh, applied uh, November 20th. And then uh, our ratings were on December 14th and December 17th. Uh, and then we, we followed uh, some of these uh, rates up uh, with the Ritamil Gold with phosphites at three pints per acre and also Revis at eight ounces uh, per acre. And you can see that uh, by the end of this trial, we had excellent control, almost total control, where we had the, the higher uh, rates, uh, well, all of the rates of Ritamil gave uh, uh, excellent control and um, uh, when they were followed up by the Revis. Uh, with the phosphites, the control was a little bit less, but still very, very significant. Uh, and you can see the rate effect uh, with the uh, Ritamil uh, when it was applied by itself and relied upon by itself. So you really need to follow up these drenches. They're not going to last forever. And um, our, typically, our foliar sprays were started about one week after our drenches were made. Here you can see uh, a bar chart showing those different results. Uh, the Rinamil, here you can see that rate effect, the 8, 16, and 24 ounces here. Uh, significant differences between those. And then when we added the Profite in this particular uh, trial, we got pretty good control. Uh, however, with the uh, Revis, we had excellent control when, followed, uh, when following that drench. This was with the uh, OXTP, and we were looking at uh, uh, three different rates here. Uh, this is with the SC formulation that we were working with at that time, uh, 2.4, 4.8, and 72.2 uh, ounces. And again, hit, this is the, the, Ritamil, or the uh, OXTP drench only. And then again, we followed the, that up, excuse me, 
uh, with the Uh, with the uh, phosphites and with Revis. And th in this particular case, when we followed it with the phosphites, it gave us good control early on, but just a few days further out, we, we lost that control. You can see a big difference between the phosphites here and the uh, Revis. So the Revis provided us a pretty good control. Uh, one week, or um, uh, let's see, that uh, quite a few days out after uh, that uh, drench, uh, and the phosphites provided significant tr control, but uh, less so than the uh, Revis did. Here's, a, here's a, a bar chart showing those results. Uh, the OXTP, not nearly as good a control when applied as a drench as the Ritamel was, at least at the rates that we tested. Uh, we did see a, a significant rate effect there, and, uh, but when we uh, applied that, even at the lowest rate, uh, followed by the Revis, we had excellent control less so with the phosphite. This surprised me a little bit, um, but um, uh, for the most part, the phosphites are, are pretty effective uh, following some of these products. So we took uh, some of these results and we, we just did a, a straight rid mill, uh, one pint per acre drench, uh, followed by some different foliars to see how they uh, would react. And for the most part, um, uh, the, followed by uh, just a straight phosphite, uh, we did see uh, a little bit of suppression, but not significant control. Uh, Prevacure was, uh, as Meg kind of showed, it's kind of a mod mediocre uh, compound. Uh, we had an experimental uh, valent product here, uh, but the others provided for high levels of control, and uh, uh, this is uh, shown in the, in the uh, um, next uh, bar chart here. Here you can see uh, the uh, uh, levels of control. Uh, Prevacure a little bit off, the, the, the uh, valent product a little bit higher, but the others uh, after following a one pint uh, uh, rate of uh, Ritamil uh, gave excellent control uh, when applied within seven days after that drenched uh, treatment. So we wanted to repeat these results, uh, and we did this uh, uh, at several different locations on two different soils, the, the uh, sandy soil and muck soil, uh, using the highly susceptible large leaf Italian. Uh, these were planted uh, at uh, February 11th, uh, 2014. Drench treatments were applied uh, at that first true leaf stage, um, and then our first foliar application one week later, and then we did another application about one week after that and our ratings were on March uh, 12th. I consider the uh, uh, mildew pressure in this particular trial to be moderate. Um, here you can see the results with uh, Ritamel Gold, and uh, we got uh, good suppression with, with all the rates of Ritamel. Uh, we, it was uh, still significant at the eight ounce rate, but our higher rates of Ritamel gave us almost total control, especially when they were uh, followed with the uh, uh, foliar applications of either Revis or ran man in this particular case. Uh, these are the high labeled rates for those particular compounds. So we did have excellent control using the drench uh, of Ritamil uh, followed by these uh, other sprays. Uh, with the uh, OXTP, uh, we, we're now looking, we're working with a different formulation. This is an OD, uh, we're, so we're working with a, a little bit different rates now, 1.2, 2.4, and 3.6 fluid ounces. I think this is going to be the uh, formulation that's gone forward with. And um, uh, here we, again, we got excellent control, but uh, at the, with the uh, drench itself, uh, we, we did see a rate effect uh, with those three different rates. Uh, and, uh, but where we combined that with the Revis or the Rand Man, we got excellent control. So uh, all three rates, uh, good control. Um, and here you can see some of these. Uh, here, you, this is a combination uh, uh, bar chart showing both the uh, Ritamil and the OXTP. You can see that the Ritamil, uh, just at that lowest rate, the drench by itself was uh, uh, significant, but, but uh, it, it definitely needed that drenching uh, follow, or the uh, foliar sprays following. Uh, you can see that the OXTP at those rates did not perform as well as the Ritamil by itself, but we did see a, a significant rate effect and where those were combined with foliar, following uh, foliar sprays, we got excellent control. Uh, this was uh, done on muck soil uh, and very similar to the uh, 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 trials uh, that we talked about previously. 
Uh, this was done this past uh, uh, spring, and here the disease pressure I considered to be extreme. And uh, again, we're looking at Ritamil, three different rates, 8, 16, and 24 ounces, uh, the drench by itself, and then followed up with foliar sprays. And because of this uh, extreme disease pressure, you can see that we did not have those zeros that we saw previously. So even with the Revis, you know, we were only down to the, the uh, single digits, but not to zeros. Uh, Randman did not perform as well as the Revis as a follow-up spray, but it still uh, provided uh, significant controls compared to where we had just the drench uh, treatments. So uh, I'd say consider, uh, considering everything, uh, pretty decent control, but not the control that we really want or need. And here's uh, the uh, trial with the uh, OXTP, the 1.2, 2.4, 3.6 ounce rates, the drenches by themselves, and then followed up by the Revis and the Randman. And here you can see much higher levels of disease. So the, the OXTP was not holding it back as well. You can see we did get significant control even at the low rate, but not nearly as, as uh, well as the uh, Ritamil Gold uh, at the three rates that it was tested at. But uh, at the highest uh, uh, rate with the drench here, uh, single digits uh, and the second highest rate uh, when it was combined with the Revis uh, applications. So these, uh, this uh, kind of shows that uh, graphically. Here you can see uh, both uh, by themselves as a, as a, a, full, a uh, drench. They did provide significant control, but nowhere near the levels that you really need. We, did only, we only saw uh, single digits down here where we combined this with the medium and the high rates uh, of these two compounds with the uh, Revis applications. We can see that there's definitely a drop in efficacy when we go to Ranman. Uh, most of my trials, uh, Revis usually uh, outperforms the Ranman, and that's uh, consistent in these uh, trials. So we did a, another follow-up trial um, on the muck uh, in the fall of uh, 2014. And again, uh, our mildew pressure in this particular trial was uh, rated as being pretty severe. Um, I'll tell you, it's, a, it's amazing in Florida, even during the, the height of our heat in the summertime, you can still find sporulating downy mildew uh, in, uh, on basil. Uh, so you've got to assume that it's always there, and that it's going to find your field if you put it out there. Uh, this is, uh, again, looking at three different rates of Ritamel Gold, 8 ounce, 16, 24 ounces. And here, uh, again, we got excellent control, um, but where we followed those uh, applications up with uh, two foliar uh, applications spaced at uh, about seven days, uh, we, we got the highest levels of the control. And here it didn't uh, matter so much. Uh, which, which rate of Ritamil we used, uh, but um, the Ranman uh, didn't perform quite as well as the, uh, the um, uh, Revis. And, well, actually, it did perform really well in this uh, particular uh, trial. Um, here you can see the OXTP, three different rates again, and uh, by themselves, and then followed up uh, with the Revis or Ranman. Here, slightly higher disease. So again, you know, at the rates that at least that we're looking at, the OXTP is not quite as, I don't think it's quite as mobile in the soil as Ritamil uh, Gold is. And um, uh, so we're, we're doing only one application of both of these, the, the OXTP as a drench or the Ritamil as a drench. I, I personally uh, w w would not recommend using Ritamil as a foliar spray. Uh, that's, that's my opinion. I think the, the place for the OXTP may be foliar, uh, and, and I think that's going to be a very good product. I know it's going to be a very good product when applied foliarly, and especially if we can use it and keep Ritamil as an effective uh, drench. But you can see we did get a good single-digit control here. No zeros, okay, but uh, g very good high levels of uh, significant control. And here you can see those uh, results. Again, the OXTP, uh, is significant rate effect, especially between the low and the medium, uh, not, not between the high and the, the medium in this particular case, but not quite as effective as a drench as the Ritamil, at least at the rates that we're looking at. 
but both uh, Randman and Revis gave us pretty good follow-up control. Here you can see Revis applied those uh, foliar and Randman applied foliarly without the drench, okay? So you can see that the applications of those drenches uh, suppressed it uh, further than those uh, foliar sprays. Uh, these, these levels here, if we were starting off foliarly, the Revis would probably give us a significant, I mean, um, enough control, the Randman, uh, foliar, not enough control. So, in terms of conclusions, uh, I, I do believe that fungicide drenches are, are, uh, offer significant, very early control of the downy mildew. Uh, it's uh, important for these, uh, uh, the, for late germinating seedlings. And I've, I've seen this repeatedly where we're direct seeding. All those seeds do not germinate at once and come up out of the ground. Oftentimes, if we're putting on a foliar spray, we get those late germinators that might miss that spray if it's a contact or a, even a, a locally systemic. And so those kind of escape that early detection, then serve as an inoculum source until that, that maybe that next uh, foliar spray. And so that's where the drenches, I, I think, really, really show their, their value. Of the two uh, compounds that we looked at in depth, the Ritamil uh, appeared and the OXCP, it both appeared to be very uh, efficacious. Uh, with the, the Ritamil showing uh, a little bit longer residual. Uh, currently, uh, the Ritamil is labeled as a soil treatment at up to two pints per acre uh, with a 21-day PHI. Um, I'm, I'm looking at it as a, as a soil, it really as a soil drench, a seedling drench, really, uh, which I hope isn't uh, too much of a stretch of the label, but I think it pays to, to be able to treat that, that seedling because then you're getting full your uptake as well as uh, root uptake. Um, I, I certainly believe that uh, foliar sprays uh, should commence no longer than one week following drenching. You saw uh, uh, a lot of places where there was no zeros there. If you're waiting one more week, at least in Florida, under our conditions, if you're waiting one week after that uh, drench application, you're waiting too long. So I, I think one week is probably the upper limit. I would recommend maybe even a little bit longer than that or shorter than that. Uh, under favorable conditions, uh, these uh, foliar sprays should be at least weekly, okay? In Florida, I, I firmly believe that, that really we need to be applying at four to five day intervals. And I, I do a lot of work. Most of my work is, is uh, stressing spraying less, okay? I will not recommend spraying less than once a week uh, with downy mildew because you'll lose control and you just lose your crop. Definitely, and this was, was brought out, tank mixing with a good phosphite at two to three pints per acre with every foliar spray, I think, helps to ensure good solid disease control and it helps to minimize the risk of fungicide resistance developing. And I've got a couple of pictures. You can see the differences that those uh, uh, phosphites make when combined with some of the better chemistry. For foliar applications, we definitely use a, a non-ionic surfactant at a, a 0 0.125 uh, volume to volume to get good coverage and you want to have enough volume and pressure. One of the things Meg kind of stressed was having those down drops uh, to get good, good uh, canopy penetration. I think that's uh, critical with your foliar applications. Here's uh, that, that point that I wanted to stress here. Here you can see our untreated checks. Uh, this is a Revis by itself. Uh, which has always given us pretty good control uh, when it's used with a surfactant, but here's where it was combined with that, that phosphite. And you can see the much thicker canopy and the, we got significant differences in uh, biomass when the phosphites were added uh, to uh, the uh, uh, good uh, foliar uh, sprays. And here's uh, with, with Randman, one of the other foliars that I talked about. Here's uh, Randman by itself. Ran man with the phosphite. You can see that thicker, uh, healthier canopy, almost total disease control with those mixtures uh, when they're put on foliarly. So, in terms of other recommendations, and this is something that, that some of our other speakers already talked about. Destroy and incorporate old plantings as soon as possible to eliminate inoculum production. I, I think this is one of the biggest mistakes our growers make is they'll, they'll harvest a field and then they kind of forget about it and it's no longer being sprayed, the inoculum just builds the huge levels and it spreads to the, the staggered plantings that we have. I, I believe firmly that if you're holding old plantings that dis, uh, display any level of downy mildew for just one more cutting, 
you're going to be biting yourself uh, in the in the end. It's going to come back to haunt you. Spray programs must be preventative. I would not recommend having the disease out there and then going out and, and expecting to bring it back into control. Andy showed how he was able to maybe get that back under control, but it, he never got to the levels that you really need to to have a marketable crop. So, in my opinion, do not try to save any young plantings that become infested from a misspray because you're going to be inoculating the rest of your uh, uh, crop. So, in summary, uh, basil downy mildew, I think, is a very, is a controllable, I won't say very controllable, but it is a controllable disease, uh, but uh, given the uh, lack of host plant resistance, hopefully we're going to have some resistance and maybe all of this will be mute, who knows. But it requires diligence, and I'll tell you, these programs are not cheap. Uh, Meg showed the, the inefficacy that, in general, with the organics, all of these conventionals, they're not cheap products. And uh, so it's an expensive program, but if you're the one that's able to control the disease and your neighbors are not, you will have a fine market. Uh, I, I firmly believe uh, the fungicide drenches in Florida, I, I think they're actually a must. And, uh, and so these must be followed with good foliar applications applied in a timely manner. No more than one week after that, that drench uh, before you start your foliar applications. And definitely, I think that the tank mixtures with a phosphite um, will give you your best results. And uh, with that, uh, I'll answer any questions that you might have. Yes, Rob? Is OXTP a single site mode of action? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think it, it may be a single site mode of action. Yeah, he asked if OXTP <coughs> had a single site mode of action. I believe it is a single site. And so, again, it, it's one of these compounds we're going to have to be very judicious in its use. As far as I know, uh, Syngenta is looking at maybe a, um, uh, giving out a label that will uh, allow you to apply it to one third of your foliar application. So if you're putting on, say, six applications, no more than two applications could be OXCP, and they have to be alternated or rotated with, with other chemistries, unlike chemistries. Um, we're hopeful that, that through IR4, uh, we will have a basal label soon. Um, I've tested OXTP on a lot of different crops against a lot of different downy mildews, and it is an excellent foliar compound. And you can see that it does have some, some soil uh, application too, but I, I think it's, it's place for the basil. Uh, hopefully, if we can keep uh, Ritamil healthy uh, and, and sensitivity there, um, I think the OXTP will be, be best as a foliar spray afterwards. It looks like the OXTP won't be registered until 2016 slash 17. 2016, according to 2017 for That's registration early. for OXTP. So uh, that's, that's bad news. <laughs> yes, Alan. I think uh, I know that we've, I think we've got the request in for Presidio through the IR4 program. He asked about uh, how far along Presidio is. Um, Catherine? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's completed. Uh, the, the yeah, whole final report's completed. Uh, it's going to be submitted in, uh, this June, so that'll take a, a year from there. So 2016? Yeah. 2000. So, guess that uh, about 2016 for uh, Presidio. Uh, we're, we are fortunate, you know, during the course of this study, really, we've gotten both Randman and Revis applied uh, for uh, field use. Uh, we have had some Section 24Cs. Some states have Section 24Cs in place for subdue and heritage uh, in the greenhouses, and we've been also part of that. Yes? Has anybody addressed or with Syngenta as far as a far more treatment or a better C treatment to use? I mean, you know, the far more 300, 400, F1, or has any of those been applied or tried to have been applied to basil seed for better control? Um, I've done a little bit of work uh, with that. Uh, we're, we're, we used a, what we called a phytodrip system, where, where these compounds are di applied directly to the seed as they're being planted. And the OXTP gave excellent results. I, I was very impressed. It, it, was, it was very uh, um, long-term results. Also, even Revis gave some pretty pr impressive results. Uh, I might be able to talk a little bit about that tomorrow. Uh, I, I think I have the results with me and I could put that together. 
Uh, just a general question. Is anybody doing any research on post-harvest? Uh, one of the concern with our growers, you know, if you find one leaf on a plant and either we're going into a box production or maybe a bag sales, what does that equate to down the road? How much is going to be lost over time? Yeah, um, I've done a little bit of work with, uh, with post-harvest uh, where we, we harvested leaves that were non-symptomatic uh, at the time and then we held them for several days out. Um, there are significant differences between some of these compounds. Um, and uh, I'd have to go back, but it, so we, we have done a little bit of that and, and it's very important uh, because uh, if you have the breakdown in transit, you know, uh, that's, that's just as bad as, uh, uh, but um, uh, sometimes you can have that symptomless tissue, right? On post-harvest, how does uh, vacuum cooling work as far as pulling the moisture out to prevent the disease in post-harvest when it's cooled down? Uh, he asked if, uh, if vacuum cooling would, would help to uh, uh, slow down or prevent the disease, uh, extracting that water. Um, you know, it might, uh, I, I would, my guess would be that it, it might suppress it a little bit, but it won't stop it. Um, you know, one of the things that came up a little bit earlier was, was greenhouse production, and, and we were talked about relative humidities. You know, it's amazing. We have a lot of uh, uh, undercover um, basil production in Florida, and uh, you know, high humidities are sufficient leaf moisture for sporulation and infection. You know, it's, you don't need overhead watering. Uh, it, it's just high humidities uh, are enough to, to allow this disease to really take hold.